President Biden has informed the G7 allies here that the United States has agreed to allow Ukrainian pilots to begin training to fly American-made F-16 fighter jets. This move represents a major reversal for Biden. And a wish fulfilled for Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, who has pleaded for F-16s for months. Oh, goody, an escalation of war. Now, in this case, as you heard in that report, the Biden administration will now allow our European allies to transfer American-made F-16s to Ukraine, something that was considered a red line by the Biden administration previously, especially when we're dealing with another nuclear power, Russia. And of course, Vladimir Putin has responded to this by threatening nuclear war with the United States, which is unsurprising. It's not the first time he's done it, but you know, maybe sending over offensive weaponry to Ukraine, not the best idea. And there is no end in sight for this war. In fact, the idea of sending F-16s to Ukraine makes it abundantly clear that the United States and its allies intend to continue engaging in this war for at least 18 months, possibly more because there's some training necessary in order to ensure that members of Ukraine's military are able to operate F-16s. We'll get to all those details in just a moment. Now, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has been asking for F-16s since the beginning of this war in the United States under Biden's leadership had refused to do so. They saw it as an escalation of war. The next video has some more details on this. The F-16, the backbone of the US Air Fleet, can travel twice the speed of sound, drop bombs on ground targets, and fire air-to-air -air missiles. Ukraine believes these planes provide a distinct advantage in the skies, enabling them to shoot down incoming cruise missiles and fighter jets, fending off Russia's punishing air assaults. But up till now, providing F-16s has been a red line for President Biden, reluctant to provoke an unpredictable escalation from Russia. Still, in a February interview with David, Biden did leave the door open just a crack. We know President Zelensky continues to say what he really needs are F-16s. Will you send F-16s? Look, we're sending him what our seasoned military thinks he needs now. You don't think he needs F-16s now? No, he doesn't need F-16s now. That was what he said in February, but clearly he has now changed his tune. Now, for the moment being, there's no indication that the United States is gonna transfer its F-16s to Ukraine. It's just that our allies will be doing so, but let's keep it real. Eventually, the United States will be doing so as well, because it's an opportunity for, we know what it's an opportunity for, send them more weapons, that creates a need for the United States to replenish its weaponry. And that means more money for the defense contractors who are absolutely salivating over this war that is now quickly becoming an endless war. And I'll explain more of that in just a moment. But Cenk, I wanted to give you an opportunity to jump in. Yeah, so guys, the administration is partly worried about it because it's an escalation. I would say that's the minority concern. Uh, they're not really talking about the majority concern, which they mentioned in some articles, but they mentioned it in passing as if it's the smaller concern. I don't think so at all for reasons I'll explain here. The, the larger concern is they don't want the technology to fall into the uh, wrong hands, mainly the Russian hands. Because it's one thing for the Ukrainians to have an F-16, it's another thing for an F-16 to get shot down in area controlled by Russia, where they could then just take the F-16 and reverse engineer it, right? And so now you might think, well, okay, that's a real national security issue for us because F-16s are excellent and it's a rare thing we do right in the US military in terms of technology. And so that could be a national security problem for us. Yeah, maybe that's a little bit of a concern too. But the larger concern is the people that sell the F-16 don't want anyone else to be able to produce cheaper F-16s without going through them. Oh, I. E. That's the defense the contractors. Oh, that, you know what? That is the most important part of the story, guys. Yeah. I mean, God forbid that these defense contractors, these military manufacturers, I mean, I'm sorry, these military grade weaponry manufacturers have some competition. I mean, that's the real war we should be concerned about, Uger. Exactly, but isn't it interesting that the media doesn't mention that? No, it's not interesting. It's the most expected part of the story imaginable. Yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, we went through the same thing with the M1 Abrams tank earlier in this war. And so the defense contractors, contractors are super nervous about their beloved technology, which they have now you know, taking billions, if not trillions of dollars off the hands of US taxpayers and taxpayers in, in Northern Europe, etc. 
that technology falling into hands that would allow them to not have a monopoly on those weapons, okay? And so that's the iceberg of this story that no one else is talking about. By the way, also true of the so-called Pentagon accounting error that you might have heard about. We're gonna talk about that later in the show. Now, John Kirby, who's a spokesperson for the White House, sat down with an, uh, sat down for an interview about this new decision to allow for F-16s to be sent to Ukraine. And uh, the big question is, you know, doesn't the Biden administration see this as an escalation of war? What, why the 180 on this topic? Well, he claims, no, no, not at all. Let's watch. Just a short time ago, the Kremlin responded, calling this a, quote, colossal risk. President Biden's concern from the very beginning with providing F-16s was that it could potentially escalate this war. What assurances does the U.S. have from Ukraine that they won't use these F-16s to fire into Russia that could widen this war? I will tell you, Peter, we have had uh, multiple conversations with the Ukrainians uh, about the risk of escalation here. Uh, nobody wants to see World War III. Uh, and uh, we have made it clear that we're not going to encourage or enable Ukraine to strike inside Russian territory. Uh, now, the Ukrainians have been very honest with us and very forthcoming and, fr and quite frankly, very uh, responsible uh, when it comes to the kind of support we're giving them, not using that to go inside Russia. Cool, I'm sure Ukraine would never do any type of offensive attack or would never even consider attacking Russia. Yeah. Except here's a story that broke today. Ukrainian official confirms group of Ukraine allied Russians crossed into Russian territory and attacked town. Let me give you some more context, but before I do, Jenks, seems yeah. like you have some thoughts on this. I do, listen guys, the Ukrainians are not going to want to violate an agreement with America because America could fund, cut off further weapons, etc. that they need. So would they attack the Russians right away? No, unlikely with the F-16s, but it depends on how desperate they get. So let's say they think that we're not going to send them any more aid, which is a possibility at some point. They think, well, we already have the F-16s and understand why they might want to use them inside Russia. Because Russia is firing missiles at Ukraine from inside Russia. And the only way to stop those is to bomb them inside Russia. So it only depends on how desperate the Ukrainians are. Once they have them, they have them. So can we just at least be blunt about how this is an escalation of war? Come on, Jank. Really? It is. Like you, no, think, I don't. You, you really think Ukraine is under the impression that if they violate any agreement with the United States, that the United States would stop sending them weapons? Are you insane? No, no. They, Come they, on. And look, there's a reason why we would care. And it, you know, a day we don't want instability because that could affect the stock market. So it's not like we have any pure motives, but we do have motives for not escalating past this. But this is definitely an escalation. And by the way, don't get me wrong. Will we escalate even further? It's enormously possible. This is a disaster. But, but guys, there's the theater as always and the real world as always. And the theater is, my God, we care about those brave Ukrainians. And is there some truth to that? Yeah, I think there's some truth to that for some people, right? But the but, but that's mainly the theater. When you get to the real world, the real world is how much are people gonna make off of it? And so it's not just the defense contractors, it's also the oil and gas industry. And we cut off the Russians uh, gas supply into Europe. Now we're replacing their supply. So, and then there's the banks who uh, gambled on the gas and there's the banks who gamble on the defense contractors. So there's a world like billion, probably hundreds of billions of dollars here on not probably, definitely on the line. Uh, for all those different industries. And they're constantly sending lobbyists to talk to politicians, including the White House, lobby, 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 to make themselves more money. They don't care about our interests, the Ukrainian interests, etc. And that is what's driving a lot of these decisions mm -hmm. while the press puts on a play about humanitarian this, you know, they're, America's worried about escalation that, when in reality, most of the decision makers are worried about how much money everybody's gonna make. Let's discuss the decision maker, shall we? Mm -hmm. uh, namely, the national security advisor who played a key role in persuading Joe Biden to allow for the transfer of the F-16s to Ukraine. And that person's name is Anthony Blinken. Now, what was Anthony Blinken up to after he was advising the Obama administration on foreign policy in Afghanistan, you know, the same foreign policy that extended and expanded upon Bush era trash foreign policy. What did he do after that, right? That little uh, space in time uh, where, you know, it was between Obama and now the Biden administration. Humanitarian work is my yeah. guess, no, hop guess. No, no, no. Working he, with the homeless. No interest in that. Uh, in mm, fact, no. he. <laughs> 
He was part of a consulting group specifically having to do with getting defense contractors in the same room as government officials. No, yeah. really? Mm, in essence, lobbying yeah. for defense contractors between government jobs in, in, in at State Department? Huh, well, golly gee, I bet this is giant news to the people in Washington. And the reporters are gonna clamor to cover this obvious conflict of interest. So as Washington Post reported, let's go to graphic five here. Blinken played a similar role when NATO was at an impasse over whether to provide modern tanks to Ukraine. At the time, Germany was hesitant to approve the transfer of Leopard 2 tanks, a roadblock that was overcome when Blinken pushed the White House to approve the transfer of M1 Abrams tanks over Pentagon reluctance. Now prior to Blinken serving as Secretary of State for Biden's administration. Blinken ran a defense related consulting firm known as West Exec. In fact, when Biden tapped him to be part of his administration, I remember researching this and writing a piece on this because I thought that there was you know, some conflicts of interest here. And surely with the development of this war in Ukraine, the conflicts of interest are pretty brazen and pretty obvious. So West Exec did not respond when asked for a list of its clients. But according to people familiar with the arrangement, they include Shield AI, a San Diego based company that makes surveillance drones and signed a contract worth more as much as $7.2 million with the Air Force to deliver artificial intelligence tools to help drones operate in combat missions. Blinken and Michelle Flournoy, another person who is, you know, close with Biden, have served as advisors to Pine Island Capital, which raised $218 million for a new fund to finance investments in military and aerospace companies, among other targets. So Blinken has a history of working on behalf of defense contractors and getting them sweet, sweet deals with the federal government. Um, and that's that's exactly what I see here. I see this as an opportunity to make money for these defense contractors. It's pretty disgusting because I don't trust, I mean, do we really trust the Pentagon when they can't even pass a single financial audit? They haven't passed one. Do we really have trust and faith in them uh, in regard to where the military weaponry is ending up? Do they have a full accounting of it? No. Of course not, uh, don't be ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> and so all of this is to enrich those folks. But guys, at the same time, uh, the Ukrainians should get our help. Uh, and the Russians definitely invaded them and they were definitely wrong. And it is definitely an imperial exercise. And, uh, and so we're stuck in the middle ground here where we wanna help uh, good people like us want to help the Ukrainians. Okay, then push without, the peace without, talks. Without getting robbed in the process. Yeah, peace talks. Okay, we don't actually, the United States government isn't actually interested in ending the war. Let's be 100% honest well, about that. Well, that's definitely true because they're not encouraging peace talks because that, that is not in the Ukrainian interest if you ask me. And the reason is that the US has a separate interest is because the longer the war goes, the more Russia is depleted. And you know, from our national security interests, the people in charge want Russia as depleted as possible. It's a proxy war. So it's, since it's a proxy war and we're not the ones that are directly involved, Russia is. They're the ones that are getting weaker and weaker and weaker as they, their military gets depleted and run into the ground. Uh, and even if they quote unquote win and get parts of Ukraine, still their military will have been devastated. Their pipelines uh, will have been shut down. Or the sanctions will blown have, up. Yeah, and, yeah, or blown up and that literally happened and it's probably one of our allies, if not us directly. And, 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 and so we will take advantage of all the things that happen because of the war. And so it's, but that puts good people in the same basket as people who have no interest in humanitarian issues and are just trying to make a buck off this. And it's an uncomfortable basket to be in. And keep in mind that this is solidifying the alliance between Russia and China. So while this is a proxy war and the thinking among the State Department is that this is weakening Russia, it is also strengthening its relationship with China. I should also note that China happens to be one of the countries that is pushing for peace talks. But the United States, because of its interests in wanting to weaken Russia, is really unwilling to push for that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the United States intends to continue this war for at least 18 months, if not longer. If you don't believe me, take a look at this final video.
President Zelensky has been begging for them for more than a year. President Biden has resisted until this point. So what changed? Nothing changed. I mean, we have been evolving our support for Ukraine as the war has evolved. And when we're talking about fighter aircraft, that's really not designed to help us in the immediate future here with the counteroffensive. The training alone, John, could take 18 months, it, the defense secretary. Well, defense that's, that's, a, that's, that's an initial estimate. As the war has evolved, we've also started to have conversations with the Ukrainians about long-term defense needs. Because when this war is over, whenever that is and under what conditions, they're still going to have a long border with Russia. They're still going to need significant defense support. So at least 18 months just to train the soldiers in Ukraine how to use the F-16s, at least 18 months. So no end yeah. in sight. Let's just be absolutely clear about that. And in those 18 months, I'm just curious, how many times does the Biden administration intend to tap Congress to appropriate hundreds of billions of dollars more to assist in the war effort in Ukraine? Yeah. While, by the way, simultaneously nickel and diming the American people, right? Right now, Biden is engaging in negotiations with Kevin McCarthy to raise the debt ceiling, and he is seriously considering work requirements for Americans who are so poor, who are so poverty stricken that they would need to do prove that they're looking for work or engaging in work in order to get welfare benefits that they clearly need because they're struggling financially. So nickel and dime the American people continue this now new endless war with you know Russia, it's a proxy war. It's just, I don't know. I, I think that the way the US has now decided to handle this is pretty disastrous and continues to get worse. So some estimates have them being trained by the fall. It's impossible to know. But the bottom line is Ukraine is doing a spring and summer offensive. They will definitely not, the F-16s will definitely not be ready by that offensive. But I also want to temper your expectations there because I see a ton of BS in the mainstream media. Not, honestly, nothing but BS in that regard. Why, if you are new to politics and, and news and you didn't follow what happened during the Iraq war, Afghanistan, etc. You might not know that whenever the New York Times starts writing about a new offensive and around the corner after that, we're gonna win the conflict. That is untrue 100% of the time. I heard that same story in Iraq, I don't know, 80 times. Oh, a new offensive and then we're gonna end the insurgency right after that. It never ends, it just goes on and on and on forever for decade after decade. And every time the Pentagon says us or our allies are doing a, a surge and we're gonna win right after the surge, it is literally never ever true, okay? So so don't buy that load of crap. And, uh, and then the last point is, so as you saw them there, well, even after the war, we're gonna have to keep sending them weapons. In other words, we found a nice little piggy bank here. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna turn this into one way of looking at it is Israel, where we're just gonna give them billions of dollars in defense spending paid for by the American taxpayer. Great. And going straight to defense contractors who one day will probably hire me for millions of dollars. Oh, That's the part of the sentence he didn't complete. But is also definitely true, which is great, you know, because the U.S. economy is dealing with a surplus right now, just a wonderful surplus, and we have unlimited resources to spend on forever wars. Great. Thanks for watching the Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, Jr. So those are super fun. But you also get. Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.